This week, two graphic novels with water-based titles. First, Gabe Canada joins me to discuss The Last Tide by Pirate Abba Shane Sandulak and Matthias Zanetti. It's the first volume of a story in the genre of Isekai, or Another World, where a character finds herself inside a role-playing video game. And then Emmett and I review Breakwater by Katrina Chapman about some people who work in a movie theater. It turns out to be about much more than that. But first, help keep this podcast coming out weekly. Support the show at patreon.com slash deconcomics. With your pledge, you can access hours of bonus podcasts, including an issue-by-issue discussion of The Amazing Spider-Man by Lee and Ditko. We'll be resuming this series with issue 14 soon. And you can join me to discuss the comic of your choice here on the show. Pledge your support now at patreon.com slash deconcomics. This is Tim, and this is Deconstructing Comics. Welcome to Deconstructing Comics. This is Tim in Tokyo. We'll start out with my talk with Gabe about the Isekai graphic novel, The Last Tide. All right, I'm talking with Gabriel Canada from the Kind of Epic podcast. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing good. How are you? All right. Yeah, long time no much of anything. We we You were on Deconstructing Comics like three years ago with your podcasting partner. Um, and yeah... <laughs> No more connection since then. We did. We did a uh, a crossover. It was a uh, it was less of a uh, crisis on infinite podcasts and more of uh, uh, just 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 a little Earth two action. Just a little, <laughs> little hopping over one 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 uh, step on the multiverse. Hmm. I see. Okay. Yeah. Is this like ultimate podcast now? The ultimate universe. <laughs> no, 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 not that, because then we'd be imploding on ourselves, or we would have been long gone at this point, I think. Right, that's true. Unless, so, unless the Sony finds a way to, to franchise us and uh, and make us plot relevant again. Well, you know, they, they took a lot from the Ultimate Universe for the MCU movies, too. It's kind of mixed it together with the with this, the uh, main universe. What's it called? Six... Oh, I'm blanking right now. 616, I 616. think, yeah. 616. I wanted to say 666, but that's something else. Um, <laughs> that's that's the uh, the Constantine world in uh, in Infinite Earths, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Gabriel wanted to talk about a book that he ran across. So tell us, like, what is this book, and uh, how did you come across it? This one, I thought this would be interesting to to talk about for a couple of reasons because you've done, and I know with uh, a lot of your contributors, um, just being a part of the um, the Facebook community that you've got for the podcast, uh, a lot of the people that you you work with um, in Japan have translating jobs, and so they're pretty familiar with so many of these isekai stories that they've had to work on the last, oh, really the last three or four years, but really the last like two to three years, and. And kind of a subgenre of that even more is just like getting sucked into a video game world or like you're in an MMO type of a situation. Mm -hmm. And so that that had been such a uh, kind of a a uh, an eastern thing, just a, like a J or JRPG, uh, J a, a big plot of of. Uh, light novels and anime adaptations and manga for for years and years, and then it's even more in like Korea and in in China, and it's it's all part of kind of the the web novel community that's there since really since cell phones became a thing, or even in some cases a little bit before that. So there's kind of like a rich kind of subgenre of literature that's associated with it, but also to the point of within your Facebook community, just kind of annoyance because there's such a repetitive nature to the genre to a certain mm -hmm. extent because they've been doing it as their job for like two or three years and you're like so what am i getting stuck with uh with what smartphone app in another world do i have this time <laughs> and so this is very much not that but it's a it's a western version of that so it is it's in the same same genre it is called um a part of a larger story called The Wandering Inn. And what really impressed me about that is that it just has a great, I mean, it is part of that kind of fun escapist portal fantasy and just kind of has that same 
uh, same kind of uh, a vibe where there are levels and gamifying things because of the the uh, an overarching system. So you have annoying pop up windows and things. But for me, that had not been a visual thing. It had been part of an actual web novel here in the West and uh, written by an American. So that was interesting that it it was coming from that perspective and it had been interpreted um, for about four years now um, on the author's own website. Uh, the same author of the of the comic. Um, and rather than going from the light novel route where it's just an adaptation of the web novel, um, this is a different route where they, they decided to actually expand the story so that you're not having to necessarily lack the context of, I mean, because there's a lot of context. There's literally, I think they're, they're at 6.3 or 6.4 million words written at this point. Wow, okay. Because they okay. publish... They, I mean, they literally write about a novel a week. So I kind of—I I may have bowed to you earlier as a fellow podcaster, but just like anybody who enjoys writing consistently on a, on a weekly basis, I don't know how they do it, other than great physical pain. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they generally put out anywhere from from twenty thousand words to to forty thousand words, which even from uh, in 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 Japan that would be or or China where they're famous about for for pumping out like three, four thousand words a day on some of these web novel projects. That's a lot still. <laughs> so it's, and the, it has no excuse to be as good as it is. If I, if I'm honest, it's just, I, I really do like it. So okay. well, we should introduce the tell from my 10 minute rant that, yeah, I really do like this. And so I was okay. really happy to be able to talk about it in comic book form. Yeah. We should introduce the book. Um, it's called the last tide. Um, how do you pronounce this author's name? So it's Pirate Abba. Pirate Abba. Okay, so the E is silent, even though it has letters after it. Okay, Pirate Abba, uh, drawn by Shane Sandulak. And did Shane also color it? Because there's no colorist credited. I don't see the colorist credited. If on, let me see it. So it's published by Cloud Sky Comics, which is a Canadian publisher. Which you can tell from purchasing it with Canadian uh, dollar dues or uh, loons or whatever they call their currency. I believe they call it. Yeah, them. it seems like it's a like a collective based in Vancouver. Mm-hmm. So I think I mean it's I don't know. I think it's published by the the people who actually are a part of that collective and have their own comic book shop as well. Oh wow, okay. So let me pull up some more information about Cloud Sky Comics on their Facebook page here. Hmm. So yeah, I reading this just kind of out of nowhere, I gathered that there are other books that come before this one. See, it's this is this is independent of itself, but yeah, it does kind of pull pull yourself um, out of the timeline. Like, so this these are characters that don't or haven't existed within the actual web novel itself. Um, but the kind of like the the context is that there's been. Well, I mean, like I said, there's six million words, so that's a lot of context normally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we can admit. But the the main thing is just like it's 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 kind of like your standard plot where people are getting sucked into another world and don't necessarily know the reason that they're, that that's occurring. Mm -hmm. And it's a it's a video game type world where um, the people who are there are quite are are used to the system. So these these are original characters, and the um, the setting is 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 the same. But it's but yeah, there's no there's no books that come before it. They are hoping for a part two, so we should. I believe they're they're working on a part two now for the comic. yeah. So. Well, that that surprised me. I didn't realize that the whole thing wasn't here. I got to the end like, oh, uh, this is the end of part one. Okay, we need to make it successful so it can continue. It's uh, I mean, <laughs> even though there's like a big. Um, it's a pretty, it's a pretty active community for the, for the web novel, especially for it being something in the, in the, in the West. I mean, because Americans are pretty, um, I'll, I'll admit I am, uh, I'm pretty deep into the weeds here, <laughs> this <laughs> might, like I'm saying. but yeah, it's, 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 it's got a, it's got its own kind of following, but yeah, we needed the, definitely need to make the comic, uh, stand out so that we can, can see more of these, uh, these adventures. And I think they may already have the, the second chapter, the second part written, but I don't, know uh, all of the details there just uh, it's kind of dependent on on the sales for the the first book which is but it is a double it is a bigger issue so it's i think what is it 50 50 total pages or uh 68 for the whole 68. file yeah. including uh, pretty much all that is story and the cover and the uh the two pages letters from the creators at the end and talking about the kickstarter they're planning to have for the second part of the book, although I couldn't figure out when that's supposed to be. But yeah, so you, you said uh, it's someone getting pulled into a type, type kind of video game world. And in this case, it's this uh, 
young woman from the Philippines named Solka. Uh, and she's very good at fishing and everybody else doesn't understand why, because, you know, in video game logic, her, her skill level is low. Uh, but she's like, you don't need skill. You just need to know how to do it. Uh, and she uses lures and she catches all kinds of fish and everybody thinks it's like magical or something. Literally. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> I think that it is uh, uh, associated with, with magic. And it's, it's kind of one of the bigger themes of the book is that um, it's largely like kids, teenagers, that type of thing. They're, they are fortunate, great, thank Thank the Lord that it is largely older protagonists. So it's usually people about like at least like 20 years old or into like mid 20s, still young. But like most of the the people are not hapless uh, teenagers like it would be in a in a kind of uh, most of the isekai that your friends have had to translate. <laughs> okay. So now what is it? What is not... isekai? I don't know that word. So that's like uh, I think it literally just means another world in in Japan, and so that's they've kind of tagged that as its own sub genre there, especially for the light novel works that people do or the web novels that people do. Okay, isekai. But then in the West, you might call it like a portal fantasy because you're going through into somewhere else, and kind of like yeah. Well, uh, I mean, it goes back to Alice in Wonderland and that kind of thing. Right? Yeah, exactly. Like there's a long continuum to it, so it's it's kind of its own fantasy sub genre for, and has been at least for a hundred years. So it's got a long it's got a long continuity to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Wizard of Oz. But now we have playing blue screens and notifications, which I'm actually excited about because <laughs> we never have had that before in the in the actual story. We would you just get like a the text color changes, like if it's an important announcement or something, and everybody is kind of universally in the world and annoyed because it happens as you're trying to fall asleep usually or have falling asleep, and then you get woken up. So even if you're happy that you're leveling, you're just like, fuck, I wanted to sleep, or darn. Right, yeah, we see her at the beginning uh, trying to sleep, and then, yeah, her she levels up in her sleep, and it's a big word, Fisher, and level seven, um, and she doesn't quite understand what it means. Um, and, I mean, it was obvious to me that there was some kind of video th video game thing going on, but you know, I'm not uh, versed in this genre as, as far as video games at all. I mean, I know Wizard of Oz and Alice in Wonderland, but um, not, not so familiar with the trapped in a video game scenario. So yeah, it's not. I mean, I would say game is the is the idea. So it's not like they they were playing a video game and in our world and got sucked into it. It's more that this is like its own like plane or world um, that has its own kind of logic and culture, and it's actually existed for a long time. But it's like one of the things that it examines is is like the mundane things like of a, in a place where like you have magic or you have a way of like monitoring these special abilities that people get. You have that, and so it's just a part of your daily life. How how does that change the world that you that you live in? So then, like you said, people just assume that you your class is what you are. So like, if you're good at fishing, you get the fisherman class, or you get the fisher class, or something related to it. And so that's obviously what your job is going to be. That's what you're going to do. And it's like, well, why are you good at it if that's not what you're doing with the rest of your life? <laughs> like? You should just do. It's kind of like if you got permanently stuck in in like a uh, in a vocational academy. And then that was, so it really could be my vocational academy in another world if, if, if your friend was uh, having to translate it. I was interested in some of the details that were included. So in this video game or this world, whatever it is, um, they only know feet and inches and you know, they don't know metric. And you know, Solka only knows metric because she doesn't live in America. Um, and it made me think, so does that mean that this game was made in America and that's why they only use feet and inches? I think Neil, Neil, Neil Gaiman might have uh, have some words if we find out the gods are American. But uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of one of the deeper mysteries of the world is that we don't know. We know, we know maybe that people have visited from Earth some other point in time but it's like in pre-recorded history and like for some reason whatever is powering this world the system like the overall system that is giving you these levels and and kind of assigning you these these uh, uh, skills or abilities or maybe even controlling all the magic and maybe even controlling the I mean building the world itself is um, 
has got English set as the default language. And mm -hmm. so like they have things that we would kind of take for granted. So like there's a universal measurement system, there's a universal language. And so those things are kind of taken for granted. And so it's, it's interesting on a couple of levels because it causes like people have to invent new reasons to fight each other, for instance. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so they've come up with all sorts of new reasons to, to dislike each other. And it's not, it's not even, they don't even have the uh, metric, uh, metric uh, versus uh, English measurements uh, argument. Also, I'm, uh, they, they don't have to worry about uh, it messing up their schools because with the class system, uh, most, uh, most people don't even go to school. Hmm. So it's, that's something that you hear in the, the web novel. So sorry for, for that. That doesn't show too much in the comic other than you see like the people who are in, on their island just kind of go about their day and they don't seem to do a lot of stuff for fun or anything. It's really just a lot of it is focused on just wanting to level because you're that's again, it's what you are. So if you got that class, that's what you go do. Mm hmm. Yeah. And it was kind of interesting that, you know, she notices that there's really nothing of value there. It's just kind of, you know, surprisingly uncluttered. <laughs> there just isn't much stuff around. It's maybe like a video game world that hasn't been a game that hasn't been played all that long yet and so they haven't accumulated many objects so what you see is that she's kind of at the edge um this is kind of a spoiler to advance it maybe just a little bit is that you see part of the reasoning behind that is that she's literally kind of at the edge of the world mm -hmm. and it's like that island is kind of like a last pit stop for uh, we don't quite know. That's, I mean, kind of one of the big mysteries. Like I said, this is its own independent story. So we've only gotten little, little, tiny, tiny hints within the web novel about what this might be. People with a place where she's at, and the, the, or the inspiration for the name of the book is called The Last Tide. And so it's kind of like the end of the road <laughs> in, on, in, a, in a literal sense for, for the people who live on this world. Yeah, well, yeah, she she sees the last tide, and it seems to be the edge of the world with all the water pouring off, except she doesn't understand why there's still water left in this world if it's all pouring off the side. It's It doesn't make any physical sense, but, um, but th yet that's how this world exists. And it's so it's it's one of the big compelling mysteries because it is kind of like a big like WTF moment for the reader as well. And because it, it's like, again, you can't really apply like our universe's logic to this world. It doesn't seem to make sense. You're like, what? It, it, where water go? Why water not disappear? <laughs> yeah. Is it like a fountain? Is the water like bubbling back up from the middle or? <laughs> So yeah, it's something that they're going to explore, but it's like it's a for that reason, like it's a legitimately dangerous place to live. And so like this is um, kind of we don't understand like the mechanics of why these people are getting pulled into this place yet, even though it's been a really big book. Like it's it's one of like the big overarching things in the mysteries is 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 it's not the focus of it. Whereas a lot of a lot of those kind of stories, it does become the focus like or or you kind of spoil it on the first page because you're like, oh, you're dead. Hi, I'm a god and we're sending you to a new world because you're the summon hero and um, go <laughs> have fun. So it's not it's not one of those scenarios like it is it is just kind of like a mystery and then people are forced to kind of make their lives there in this new place. So it's more about like discovering like, well, I'm, I'm here now. I have no idea how I got here. I'm going to, um, uh, I would like to not die. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I'm going to, how do I, how do I live? What am I going to do? And so that's for, for them, we don't know the, the greater mysteries of this world yet. And so getting a chance to explore that by seeing, just literally just how weird it is just i mean that because I, I think there's a sense of disbelief that you're in another world until you're even with waking up with like the system notification but then when you're in your boat and then you drive to literally the edge of the world you're like oh oh yeah i get it yeah i'm i'm, I'm uh, not in kansas anymore <laughs> yeah um so i i would like to say that i thought the uh, the art in this was quite good and i really liked the coloring you know, it really had a nice kind of, there's a lot of ocean scenes and it really has a nice ocean feel to it, the, the color choices. I didn't see, I think it is still just the main artist. So I didn't see the colorist credit there. I apologize. So if I do find that later, I will send that to you via. Well, yeah, I'm, via I'm guessing probably the artist did the colors. Maybe, maybe it's probably all one process, maybe. 
but yeah, even I mean, I I really appreciated the art style they did this because, like I said, there's no real like pizzazz to the level ups or anything like that in the system. So we had no clue that there was neat details like with the Fisher class scene, the um, the little. Um, the little details that they put on there of having an actual fish or a crab, things like that around. And then also just giving the visual detail to the world. Like you said, the color palette, the choice that they did with it being nautical and obviously letting I mean, it's nice. I mean, it's also nice just to have the fact that it's the, the protagonist is a person of color and like there's no. <laughs> you don't have to, to have like uh, some kind of weird description like, oh, no, no, she's just. Yeah. Yeah. So it from the Philippines. I get it. Yeah. It's not then, some white guy from California. It's. <laughs> Yeah, she's female. She's not white. She's not from America. Uh, that that yeah, that surprised me. But uh, yeah, in a positive way. See, and it, and it is interesting because the cast is fairly uh, international, but the main protagonist in the in the web novel is is an American, and so it's nice to to get a chance to have that representation. And there's already been like fan art from people, which was was really and, and kind of made me tear up a little bit because there was one Filipino fan who is an artist and sent in before they even published the comic had sent in. <laughs> a piece and just like i was so was happy to see themselves in the story and i'm like that is really cool and hope we get to see more comics with some some filipinos in it and it was it was a it was a nice thing i can't think of uh, a lot of i know they added one recently uh to to dc i think had just gotten a a, a superhero with uh, one of the mainline comics i'm trying to remember her name she's got ocean controlling powers it's pretty neat okay but it's not, yeah, it's a nice it's a nice bit of representation. Maybe there's some underrepresented critters here because I think you're going to have a chance. One of the cool things about this comic potentially is that a lot of the uh, real world uh, or myths on Earth are populated in this place. So maybe we might get to see like some dick belongs or some kind of crazy uh, Filipino monsters as a result of having such a cool lead too. So I'm hoping for that because if it, if it's this artist, it's going to be a pretty darn good uh, representation, I would think. So you might have some, some pretty freaky looking monsters. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Um, I mean, I think maybe I, I, especially the first time I read it, I felt like, I feel like I wanted a little bit more to happen in this story. It was, it was a little sedate. Um, it felt like there wasn't a lot happening that was really like a plot. Um, I guess you know, at the end there are some interesting developments, but um, yeah, it just felt a little short on story to me. I think a lot of it is that, like I said, it is kind of. Um, I should. I made it a little bit long winded by, by in my explanation earlier, but I would say kind of like you would put it in maybe like a slice of life genre. Maybe it would be mm -hmm. the best way of explaining it even though it has all these other fantasy elements to it and so that's that's probably i mean a fair idea is that it is kind of like literally idyllic maybe you've got like i said just nice scenery that you're looking at and kind of kind of understanding who these people are and where or where they are in the world and then a lot of the action is saved for really the last like four or five pages uh, in a fairly sizable story but like you said it is mainly story it's about 62 pages of or of story there so mm -hmm. it's yeah, and I guess a lot of it is kind of orientation, too, and I would expect that the second part will be a little more, have a little bit more momentum to it. you got to get them levels. <laughs> <laughs> get them sitting around, so yeah, it's, uh, I, I imagine that's the, that's the idea. You gotta, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm trying to avoid the, the fishing metaphor here, but I'm saying you got to hook them. <laughs> hmm. No, that, that works, because that's what she's doing here. Hook on those fish. What did you What did you think of the? Um, so we mainly talked about about Sulka. What did you think about her two um, other other inhabitants of the island? So our kind of our we call it. I guess there's no. Like you mentioned there's not a world name, but like everybody because the the main story is called the Wandering End. People kind of call it in world or inverse. And uh, you've got uh, a dwarf uh, on on the island with her taxis. And uh, also a really cool uh, character who is a half human, half Dullahan. So they're yeah, kinda... chime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the, and these these Dullahans, what like their their bodies kind of you can take them apart, <laughs> and you get these people who leave their heads on the shore and go diving in the water, and, and they can stay down forever because they don't have to worry about breathing. 
interesting idea. It is a, it's a idea. pretty fanciful cheat. Like, yeah, like you said, like like you said, they've got like pretty much nothing on the island, and so the only people who can possibly survive there have got to have like high level cheat skills in this thing. And like, I feel like that entire race is just like a cheat skill. You're just going around like, nope, nope, yeah, uh, yeah, this seems kind of boring, and I would probably drown. So I'm I'm just gonna literally uh, put my head over here and enjoy lunch and uh, yeah, go. Uh, my body is gonna go dive down to the depths of the bottom of the ocean and uh, and uh, yeah, farm uh, farm dangerous seaweed that will kill people. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Uh, do you have any idea, or were you were you able to find when the Kickstarter is for part two? I couldn't locate it. I wasn't even sure what I was looking for. If it was if it's called the last tide, the last last tide, or. The- <laughs> the Last Tide Part 2, or if it has a completely different title. I Kickstarter. I was trying to pull up more on Cloud Sky, but let's see. Here we go. Not the Facebook this time. Oh. The website is actually pretty well put together. It's a small detail, but yeah, for, for a new publisher, they are not going off of like a... Uh, who is your? I mean, do you have any uh, any podcasting websites that it would be good to uh, to plug right now? Like, uh, do you have a uh, stamps dot com type of thing for uh, for web? <laughs> to- no, I don't. Support us on Patreon. <laughs> which is which is how this interview got uh, or this uh, review got got happening. So yeah, if you if you all punt and pitch in ten bucks and uh, help uh, unlock some older episodes, you also get a chance to talk about uh, comics that you enjoyed so but this is a pretty good incentive i think yeah if you give what is it if you give you give ten dollars a month for at least three months then you can come on the show and talk with me about a comic that you enjoy um and also we're getting closer to our goal of uh, unlocking that uh, full metal alchemist podcast that Patrick and I have started and we, we got impatient. We just started putting it out in, in the deconstructing comics feed once a month, but we would like to like it to have its own feed and come out more often. So, so it's an equivalent exchange is what you're telling me. 10 bucks will help me. Uh, unlock. <laughs> right. It's the law of equivalent exchange. So yeah, I apologize. I am not seeing more information about that. I do see that they were actually quite happy with the launch. They had 800 orders um, at launch, so that made a new record for for them, for uh, for the opening of a of a comic. So I think even if there is not a part two Kickstarter, I think that the idea is that this is going to continue as long as they get enough orders to to show mm-hmm. that this is a, a viable a viable thing. But it seems like a lot of this is that it's an independent publisher, so a lot of the uh, the people who who they work with are have original stories and. Uh, kind of self-fund uh, their work, and this is uh, a medium for for putting it out there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anything Seems. else we need to say about this? Uh, well, I'd say. I mean, do you want to? Like I said, we've mentioned the publisher a couple of times, Cloudscape. So if you to actually pick up the comic, it is there are physical copies, but you can also buy. I think we both bought the uh, the PDF directly from the website, so you can do that mm-hmm. on the escape store i highly recommend just like checking out the actual wandering in um web novel and then also just curious like because because i mentioned that uh some of the i think malali or some of the other people who are contributors that who had had that experience with uh, with that but you so you were not familiar with the um with kind of like isekai manga or things like that kind of trapped like maybe like dot hack sign or yeah no those type of things no i haven't haven't read any of that stuff Oh, where have you? I, I would say where have you been hiding, but you're in Japan. How have you avoided? <laughs> <laughs> I'm too busy putting out my own content. <laughs> I am so I am actually kind of jealous of you because I'm like it had been kind of a almost like a genre takeover type of thing. I think they're probably like at least. I mean, in terms of just like even like the ones getting anime adaptations, I think over the last two or three anime seasons, there's probably been at least twenty or or thirty of these type of stories that they've, that they published. And so that means there's like three or four times that maybe five times that kind of getting published in manga at the same time. So like, that's a lot <laughs> <laughs> to the point where, like you said, people are like literally just like these long iterative titles of like, I am stuck with my smartphone in other world is like a short one 
And they're normally famous for these infamously long titles like I can't believe my mom's double attack is so much more popular than mine in another world. <laughs> as long as an in another world comes in at the end, you can, can really kind of justify whatever the plot is in the entirety of, of your premise, fitting it all into one sentence as your title and making translators cry because they have to somehow get that into English. Yeah, well, speaking of smartphones, Sulka mentions that she has one that's waterproof, but how does she charge it? <laughs> that's actually a good point. So, like, uh, yeah, I don't think that she is she's able to really do that on the island. So she's kind of gotta gotta be careful with that. It's like some of the other people in the in the story. If you're doing it not from the comic, they um, they can get a mage or somebody to maybe maybe fix the phone for them. But for the most part, like, yeah, that's it. You don't you don't have electricity. So yeah, you're not gonna get that charged unless you're yeah. you got like a solar charger or something with you. And well, she, she might though, because she, she, she actually was pretty crafty. She probably can't get a signal out there either. No, five <laughs> G has not has not made it there. The Verizon guy is not walking. He might. I wouldn't be surprised if the Verizon guy got uh, got isekai. Yeah, she'll probably just have to play the games that are on her phone. That's about all she can do. Listen to the music on it. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Uh, well, thanks for uh, bringing this book to our attention so we can keep an eye on when the Kickstarter happens. But yeah, I, I, I'm sorry that I didn't didn't have more information about the, the second part. I'm going to check. Yeah, I, I don't think so there is any. Because yeah. like if you, uh, at least not on the, the publisher's website, but I was going to say the actual community for the for the the last tide they have their own uh kind of like sub discord which is which is kind of fun they make the the biggest meme about it i one thing i can't believe we talked for 30 minutes and if if you're just looking at the discord you would think that the entirety of the story was just about abs <laughs> art. but yeah like sulka is sulka is pretty ripped so yeah she is she's not uh she has not been eating a lot of fast food in another world so no. <laughs> yeah, there's world, a right? there's a lot of fan art of like the author, the pirate Abba, and she's like, I'm looking at one right now that has her with with uh, Sulka's abs on uh, her face, and then Sulka's abs. <laughs> 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 so it's yeah, it's or, or at least the uh, the emoji version of of the author, because actually I don't know the author's uh, uh, gender, because it's it's a it's a pseudonym. So pirate Abba is the author, and uh, and uh, uh, yeah, that's. There was a sentence there, and I, I lost it. <laughs> I'm just Got away this, from you. This weird abs picture. This, there's yeah. There's a lot of there's, but I highly recommend the going on to um, uh, to your Patreon and supporting like I did, but also um, uh, checking out the the Patreon for uh, the Wandering Inn as well. Um, that's uh, under the Wandering Inn or Pirate Abba, their their name uh, for the author. Uh, so you can find uh, they will have more information about about the second second part so if you don't see it on on cloudscape or or get an email alert from them you would definitely get an email alert from the the patreon side of things so that'd be the best source and then check out the discord as well and then you can go and chat about about the last titan get kind of uh details uh, about about the uh, kickstarter if it comes out or if if there will be one and also just like continuing uh tidbits from the author themselves because they like to chat and interact with the fans there the last tide is published by cloudscape Coming up, Katrina Chapman's Breakwater, a story that sneaks up on you. Thanks to our supporters on Patreon, another set of classic early episodes of Deconstructing Comics have been unlocked, and I'm putting them back on the site in reverse order. This week I'll republish number 41 from September 18th, 2006, in which Brandon and I discuss character design, Kevin Smith and Terry Dodson's Spider-Man Black Cat, The Evil That Men Do, and an update on Mulele, who had moved to Los Angeles at the time. Find the classic episodes on our Facebook and Twitter feeds by choosing the earliest months listed in the sidebar pull-down menu at deconstructingcomics.com, in publicly available posts on our Patreon page, or in the Patreon smartphone app. Classic episodes have been unlocked back to number 31, so only 10 more classic episodes will be re-released unless we meet our next Patreon goal unlocking 15 more classic episodes, and putting our Fullmetal Alchemist podcast The Law of Equivalent Exchange in its own feed and on a more frequent release schedule. 
Check out all our goals and help us reach them at patreon.com slash deconcomics. Welcome to the Superman Fan Podcast. My name is Billy Hogan, and I will be your host. Before we begin our journey through the time barrier, please ensure that your red indestructible capes are securely fastened around your necks so that we may all travel safely into the past to explore the Silver Age adventures of the Man of Steel in the pages of Action Comics, Superman, Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, Superman's girlfriend Lois Lane, and World's Finest Comics. After we return from our journey, I encourage you to go to the website, the thesupermanfanpodcast.blogspot.com. I look forward to have you join me each week to explore the Silver Age adventures of the Man of Steel. Okay, I'm on Skype with Emmett. How are you doing? Very well, Tim. Thanks for having me back. Sure. It's been a little while ago now that we talked about uh, Zoe Thorogood's book. Um, mm. And when I inquired to Avery Hill about that book, um, I was in touch with uh, Katrina Chapman, and she's the uh, head of marketing and business development there, and she's also a comics creator herself and she sent me her book also as well as zoe's and it is katrina right you corrected me on the pronunciation of it because the spelling to an american looks like catriona it's katrina i mean maybe maybe it isn't because she spells it with a k and typically in gaelic you'd spend it with spell it with a c hmm. and there would be an i before the t um but i also have a uh, goddaughter in this part of the world called Nave, but it's spelled for the benefit of Australians, N-E-A-V-E, which annoys me no end because the correct spelling is N-I-A-M-H. <laughs> so I get very annoyed um, with the anglicization of Irish names. But uh, for all I know, this could be uh, a Greek name. I don't know. I mean, it, it has, it, there are various common rules in a, is how I would say her name, and I assume that's the correct pronunciation. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, so uh, this book is called Breakwater, uh, being released November 11th, 2020. I'm not sure when this episode's going up. It might be, it's gonna, probably going to be somewhat after that. Um, hmm. But uh, yeah, so I, it's taken this long to, to get to it because the, the schedule and the number of other episodes that have been in the queue and so forth but um so i did finally sit down and read this uh and the first thing i noticed is the art because it looks like it's drawn with charcoal or something exactly what i was going to say yes and if you were to compare that to the work of belinda gebby or carol swain i think uh Chapman's in good company. Um, Carol Swain did one of my favorite books of the last 10 years, uh, Gast, which is a story set in sort of regional uh, Britain about a young girl who befriends um, a very lonely girl. She's having these conversations with animals that may or may not be actually happening. And the art is the same soft edged, very evocative um, style. And I think you're right. I think it's like a soft pencil. Uh, I'm not an artist, but that's that's what it suggests to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's very emotive and invites the eye in. Uh, so there's a sort of internal space that these characters share in Breakwater. And I think she's done a really good job of setting that up for us. Um, yeah, I, I quite like the style of art. Mm -hmm. I particularly like the, the cover that's in color. Um, some really nice color choices. Um, mm. it's with the, uh, the movie theater, which is central to the story and it's called breakwater, uh, kind of in the background. And then I think those are the two main characters there in the distance on that, uh, on that walkway. And then there is a breakwater yeah. extending out into the ocean and a seagull. Mm. Mm. And lots of nice kind of ocean blue kind of aqua in it. 
which is, you know, suggestive of a certain dreaminess mm -hmm. and a certain idea of like tidal motion coming and going. And um, I don't know how much we're going to get into discussions of this, but uh, certainly one of the topics raised in this is the idea of mental health and stability mm -hmm. and how it can shift. So there is something tidal about it. Uh, so I, I'm quite... I quite think that's a very interesting title and sort of gives you a clue as to um, even a sense of pace that this comic has, mm -hmm. which was deceptive, I found. Right. Well, so I was reading this and reading it and reading it, and I was like, well, you got these people working in a movie theater, and they're getting to know each other, and they're chatting, and they're you know, talking during work, and they're talking off hours, and you know, becoming closer friends. And I'm like, okay, what's the story? Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, past the halfway point when this reveal comes, I'm like, oh, so the story's kind of snuck up on me. I've been reading the story all along and I didn't quite recognize it because it's about such everyday things um, yeah. and, you know, really goes at the pace of life, I would say. Um, mm. and what made, what made me even more frustrated <laughs> was that I felt like I should have caught it because, um, <laughs> okay. because my sister <laughs> suffered from the same problem as Dan. Yeah. Um, and you know, I've, I've seen all this, you know, the, mm. the self-destructive behavior, um, and I <laughs> missed it <laughs> in the story. Mm. Maybe just I wasn't expecting a story with that in it. Um, I was, you know, usually we read comics and they're, you know, to some extent more kind of fantastic out of this world type stories. Um, you know, a lot or of science signpost. fiction. And, they, they, they signpost the issues really early. They let you know what story mm, you're in yes, and yeah, what moral e questions are going to be raised. Even Whereas if it's this, not a supernatural said, story, yeah, at least yes. it'll, you know, in the first 10 pages, you'll say, oh, it's about this. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So you feel you were in the position of the main character, Chris, almost in a way? You know, you didn't see the signs? Yeah, I guess so. Um but yeah, I I felt like I should have recognized them, um, mm. but yeah, they were just they were it was done so subtly, um, and you know it, it's at kind of a everyday life pace mm -hmm. that uh, it snuck up on me. I really enjoyed that. I re as I said already, I really enjoyed that aspect of it. I really enjoyed that sense of um, the day to day existence of Chris and Dan and the routine of work and how this draws in this idea of routine and you know we have these sort of moments these little interludes where Chris is at home and she maybe has a glass of wine and she's wrapped up on a couch and looking at TV and the TV is the only source of light in the room as well there's this sense of darkness all around her and loneliness mm -hmm. and then we'll have a cutaway to an empty street and what's clear is the street is empty and therefore like it, it lacks meaning because it's meant to have lots of people on it. It's like a, it's like a market street. Mm -hmm. And compare that to the space of the cinema itself, which is a bit run down and aren't as many uh, customers going to it as maybe there would have been one time um, from all sorts of changes, how we live and how we seek out entertainment at home now we don't certainly now uh, I've been <laughs> yeah. to cinema uh, in for most of the year I mean since January I think um, yeah. yeah March so that, re that really hit me and that, that sense of um, how the cinema as an institution could be dying right in front of us right now mm -hmm. um, but it was already dying and I, I say this as a former uh, film journalist but like there is this sense that the business model of the cinema is from a previous time and maybe it hasn't hasn't been brought along with the disruptive entertainment markets that have descended on us in the 21st century mm -hmm. um, but the other thing about this and this idea of routine and the day-to-day -day existence that the folks in the story have in the cinema is I used to work in a cinema mm. uh, it was actually one of my first jobs 
uh, the um, the Ormond Cinema in Slorgan. It's still there. It's in Dublin. And uh, I had very, very similar experiences <laughs> to the characters <laughs> in the story. Um, so when you had this sort of sense of shock over the reveal, I had this sense of shock as I was reading the comic going, that happened to me. Mm. <laughs> that exact thing happened to me. <laughs> and, you know, the encounters with the customers mm. who are so rude to Chris and Dan's like encouraging her to speak up for herself. And like, you can't let them walk all over you, all this kind of stuff. Like, I've had moments like that. I've had experiences like that. And the bit that broke me finally was the scene where he he previously worked at a cinema, hadn't he? Like years before. Hmm. And he finds this tool, which is you can collect all the different ticket stubs and you can just slip them onto a little hmm. hanger almost. Yeah, yeah. That's early Whoa. on when he first gets hired. Yeah. Now, what we used to do was there was this curtain at the back of the uh, back of the cinema so the we let the people come in they we sit and sit them in the audience and then as we were walking out the door there was these folded bits of fabric up against the wall and we would slip the stubs into there <laughs> <laughs> and it was almost like a competition how many could you fit into the fold without it all falling out <laughs> <laughs> when i saw that i was like we should have had one of those that would have <laughs> been really useful <laughs> I was really taken with the story. I, mean, I, really, I really appreciate you saying, um, if I were to review it with you, actually, Tim, because I just, yeah, I, I had a very um, emotional experience reading it. Uh, it, was, it was quite mm. winning for me. Yeah, I mean, even even though I couldn't identify the story at first, um, yeah, it just sort of the leisurely pl- pace and the pleasantness of it, and mm. you know, just the. Uh, how well I think it captured, you know, real life, you know, working and meeting people. Um, it kind of kept me going at it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as we've mentioned again, and again, it's this idea of pace and, uh, work as something which breaks up your day and, you know, work is something you do, but maybe it's not something you should let be done to you. So these moments where Chris is taking a break and having a smoke or doing a cross search or just dreaming into the middle distance, you know, uh, you know, maybe somebody might read that and go, Oh, she's been lazy, but like, come on, she's on her feet all day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you want? That matter. You need to do that. You need to like work with work. You need to actually make this time still your own. Um, so I, I, I found that quite, uh, interesting too, just how, how her working day is depicted, and the fact that herself and Dan and the other colleagues, uh, particularly the young boy, um, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, Craig. So that idea of him having, um, he's been, she's told he's a hand, he, Dan's told he's a handful, and he acts out, and he clearly is looking for attention. But over the course of the story, because they keep engaging him, you can see he's changing. Like he's becoming more responsive and maybe more pathetic, and maybe he simply wasn't socialized. Like people weren't speaking to him as a person; they were speaking to him as a problem child. Mm. Whereas if you treat him like a person, then he actually comes out of his shell. And he, like towards the end of the story, he's stepping up and he's helping out more. And I thought that was uh, the the as the way the story grows. Mm-hmm. quite gradually like Trina Chapman sort of introduces all these characters and introduces these situations and then just lets time move and you then get an appreciation for what she's doing because she actually is de- changing these characters slowly but surely and we're seeing them like all of them coming at the end of the story on a different path I feel mm-hmm. which is interesting yeah. Now you mentioned uh, Dan saying to Chris, uh, "Not let, not to let the customers walk all over her." Um, mm-hmm. But you know, by the last third of the story, um, Dan himself is threatening to walk all over her, or at least he's becoming yeah. really a handful. Um, yes. And Chris is. You know, up to a point, she's just kind of trying to take care of him by herself. And, you know, he tries to kill himself and so forth. And and he doesn't want to talk to his family. And, you know, she's 
it's you know eating into her own life because you know Dan suggested that she go back to school um cuz she had been studying i forgot what what it was she'd been studying before that she social work off on. i think it was social, social, social she wants to be a social worker and she'd fallen off of that and she had to give that up because she yeah she had to care for her father who was sick mm, yeah and then she just never got back to it yeah there's this sense of her being taken advantage of mm-hmm. repeatedly so yeah she's spending so much time taking care of dan that you can you see her just you know she's really tired she gets home she sees her textbooks on the desk and just kind of stares at them and then goes to bed so you know it's eating into her own priorities and so finally i don't really want to completely give away the ending but you know she has to do she has to hurt dan to help him and to kind of claim back her own life too yeah, I mean, there is a sense that this story is a meditation on what it is to be a good person or a kind person. Mm-hmm. Uh, to what extent do you put yourself out for another? And I think we've been served a lot of stories where a similar situation would have happened and the hero character would go all out of their way to save this other person and to a ridiculous extent. And then this other person is redeemed, and then it's like, oh, thank you, and then they all live happily ever after. You know, you don't reflect on how much time and effort did this person put into the other. Mm -hmm. Um, Sort of, uh, the Manic Pixie Dream Girl approach to um, making a man a better person. You know, Mm -hmm. literally somebody pops into your life and all of a sudden just gives up everything to be with you and changes everything about themselves to be with you. And then you both come out of it better. Um, Again, this movie, this, sorry, this comic may tantalize at the prospect of it being a romance, but it it isn't because they are, they're strictly friends and uh, not romantically inclined. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, Interesting, again, that um, Chapman is sort of acknowledging the different narrative shortcuts or tropes that we all know and then taking a different path each time. Mm-hmm. And where it ultimately comes down in is this idea of being good and kind. Like working in a cinema, the, the first conversation they have is about work and the kind of job they do in the cinema. And Chris is saying, well, People look down on us for being in the service industry. Don't mind because I get to do the work and then I go home and I don't have to think about it. And that's fine. And I think, again, that is an attitude which a lot of people would see as lazy or not ambitious enough or, you know, and, and to a degree because she, she has sacrificed her academic ambition. But there's also nothing wrong with doing that kind of work if it makes you happy. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. But maybe in our society, we don't talk about that we, we, we say no you know go for the top aim for the brass ring you know do all these things and she's like no i like working in the cinema i like the people i work with um i enjoy spending my day there what's wrong with that uh i i, I really think it's it's a story about goodness and kindness and uh, somebody just making their own way and trying not to hurt other people and you know learning that balance between not hurting and maybe standing up for themselves Right, yeah, and you know, trying to be a good friend, but not to the point where you can't take care of yourself or you can't uh, mm. reach your own goals anymore. Yeah, it's it's yes. hard to balance that. Mm. If someone has you know big problems like mental illness or something like that, yeah, I mean. Yeah, because my parents tried to help my sister way too much, mm. and it really, really, they really hurt themselves in some ways because they yeah. just kept helping her. They just kept bailing her out. Yeah. yeah, and it's like the person isn't a problem for you or anyone else to fix. The person is a person, and. Part of that is, uh, I don't know, the solution, but I think part of that is um, reminding the individual that they can, you know, there, there, there is a, there is a um, two-way approach to this. You know, you need to be invested in your own help, mm-hmm. if you like. Um, and I, I'm, I'm wary of straying too far into this conversation because I don't want to be seen as insensitive, but I think 
there is a degree at which uh, we can only do so much for some folks. And you mm-hmm. need to be conscious yourself of what you can or cannot do. Uh, and, that, and that's also important. Mm-hmm. As, as much as helping people is important, you just need to know that line. Um, yeah. Now, of course, I'm talking about my parents, and that's a little bit different sure. than just being a coworker uh, who becomes a friend. But, yeah, I mean, um, I do wish that they had handled some things differently. <laughs> mm. Hmm. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, family is tough, and I think what's interesting about what Chapman's done with the story is Chris is introduced as somebody who has no one in her life at all, and Dan is so vibrant and he's so engaging, and he helps Craig. And he's able to mm-hmm. speak to him like an adult, and he sort of like that. That conversation they have about evolutionary theory is really good. Actually, it's a nice bit of back and forth in terms of dialogue, um, and I think through him. Chris recovers a sense of who she is mm-hmm. and maybe she breaks out of the maudlin routine she was stuck in to some degree. I mean, she, she seemed content, but maybe she wasn't challenging herself enough and he sort of draws her out more, but there's a line there where she's then interceding on his behalf with his family and, and his brother and helping him out and giving him romance advice or looking the other way when he does something at work. And so she's becoming increasingly wrapped up in him. Mm-hmm. And that's where there needs to be that uh, breakaway. You know, I, I can't, I can't be swept away with this person. I need to actually go my own way. Mm-hmm. Um, that that's interesting, and it's again. I think we. I keep coming back to this, but the, the pace, the softness of the art, mm-hmm. the sense of intimacy in this book. I think it, it it sort of invites you in, and then once you become engaged with the book, then you suddenly. Re- experience the emotional highs and lows of this character chris Mm -hmm. so as a comic i think this is and as a piece of writing and a piece of art i think it's very 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 good i i I think i'll be happy to have this on my shelf again tim avery hill are going for two for two with us so far like this yeah maybe we need to just bug them to send us everything they publish (laughs) (laughs) hmm yeah, yeah, yeah. This this is good. Yeah, at first I wasn't sure, but actually that's that was the same way I felt about Zoe's book. Mm-hmm. Like first, like what's this about? Is something happening? But yeah, mm-hmm. by the end, there's like, yep, okay, this this was worthwhile, and I felt the same about this one. Yeah, car- cards on the table here. I um, I, I I do some comics writing outside of podcasting about comics, and uh, a week ago, this idea hit me out of the blue, like like just. This it's in, in, in based on something I was reading, uh, so it was a period story idea and actual historical people, people who did exist and their relationship, and it just came fully formed into my in my head how to approach this story, and I just got really excited. I started writing down notes for it, and then I was thinking to myself, wait, who would read this? <laughs> this, this is something for you, Emmett. You're interested in this kind of writing and these people in this period. This is something that you are interested. In. Who else would do? And I have to say, these two books we've, we've reviewed have inspired me in some way. And going, actually, there is a market out there for this kind of stuff. <laughs> you don't need to have capes on everybody. It doesn't need to be post-apocalyptic wilderness with you know heavy oh, drama. Oh, you please. Know, you no, can more tell. Po- no more post-apocalyptic <laughs> worlds, please. <laughs> you can tell a human drama with um, genuine emotion and tied to real world events. And maybe people will read that because, well, we haven't had that many stories like this. Certainly um, in, in, this, in this, this approach, this idea of let's, let's take the time to get this right. I, I, I'm very inspired by the way both of these books from every hill so far have used time mm-hmm. um that that's that's really encouraging me so yeah i i've enjoyed i've enjoyed these two mm-hmm. yeah me too breakwater by katrina chapman is published by avery hill it's dcp in touch where we hear from our listeners Via YouTube, we got the following from Ornez about last week's Doro Hedoro review. Quite interesting discussion. I loved hearing your thoughts on Doro Hedoro. 
Do you plan on reviewing the series in its entirety? I've heard many people discuss the beginning of it up until season one of the anime ends, but almost nobody is analyzing the later parts and the finale of the series, and I'd love to hear a discussion of that because it gets quite deep eventually. If you ever decide to continue, I'd love to listen to it. Ornez, I've passed your request on to Kumar and Emmett, so I'll leave it up to them. Do you agree with Ornez? Would you also like to hear Kumar and Emmett talk about the rest of Doro Hedoro? If so, send email to mail at deconstructingcomics.com or write us about whatever else you'd like to hear. Want to support this podcast? You can help us out by joining us on Patreon at patreon.com slash deconcomics and go to deconstructingcomics.com to connect to us on Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube to shop on Amazon to support the show, and to find links to subscribe to the podcast. Our theme is by J.B. Anderton. If you're looking for some constructive feedback on your comic, send it to us and we'll critique it on our spinoff podcast, Critiquing Comics. Send it to mail at deconstructingcomics.com. We'll read at least 30 pages of it and critique it on the show. Another episode this Saturday with a mysterious new guest co-host. Then next week on The Law of Equivalent Exchange, Patrick and I talk about Hiromu Arakawa's manga series Fulminal Alchemist, Chapter 4. After that, we're going to be taking a few weeks off for the holidays, but we'll still have content for you. Critiquing Comics will continue to appear every other Saturday, and on Wednesdays we'll present the first few episodes of Tim Catches Up with the MCU in which Mulele prevails on me to finally watch the MCU movies so he'll have someone to discuss them with. So, uh, till Saturday, this is Tim, and thanks for listening to Deconstructing Comics. <laughs>